preconceived notions are to some extent always a little bit of a dangerous thing. For example, haven't most of us already made up our minds around understandings of who Jesus' disciple Thomas was that we hear about in the scripture text for today? We know him as Doubting Thomas. Yes, that's what many of us were taught to call him. Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection, and we must not, under any circumstances, be like Doubting Thomas. But you know, the older I have become and the more I have learned by study and experience, the more I want to revise my opinion of Thomas. In fact, there are two things I want to point out about this old familiar story of Doubting Thomas today that I hope will keep us from completely embracing our preconceived ideas about who Thomas was and his legacy. The first thing I hope we'll see from Thomas' story is that doubt is not always such a bad thing. In fact, if you review the lives of the great prophets and saints from Jeremiah to Mother Teresa, you'll find plenty of evidence of doubt. It's not uncommon at all. It's there in all the greatest and most faithful lives. And I've actually come to wonder if maybe you can't really possess the fullness of a great and vigorous faith until, through doubt, you've examined it and you've struggled with it and you've worked for it. It's been said that Jesus himself was a doubter from a certain perspective. At least he knew how to employ it creatively for the life of faith. He doubted that anger and violence were ways to resolve differences, so he said, forgive one another. He doubted that the long prayers and rigid dietary laws and cleanliness codes of his religious tradition were essential to faith. So we talked about practicing an honest and simple and trusting faith. He doubted that Samaritans were of less inherent worth than others, so he told the parable about the good Samaritan and the neglectful priest. The biblical story of Thomas is found only in the Gospel of John. And by the time the writer of John's Gospel records this story, it's from a distance of around 70 years after Jesus' death. That's a time when Jewish and Gentile Christians were experiencing tremendous persecution from the Romans. Certainly, those Christians were doubtful frequently about the wisdom of having adopted this new faith. The risks were great, and many of them were tempted to go into hiding for their own self-protection. So now with that backdrop, we can see why the author of John's Gospel would have felt it particularly meaningful to tell the story of the very first group of Jesus' followers who, after the crucifixion, were also doubtful about their futures and tempted to go into hiding. They were all huddled in an upper room, locked away behind these securely closed doors, and it's there that we encounter Thomas. You know the story. He had ventured out from the closed room one day and missed Jesus' appearance among the disciples. And when he returned to the room, he refused to believe what they had to say and their assertions that the risen Christ had been there. And why was he doubtful? Now I think this is critical to the story and leads us to the second point I want us to see, which is this. Thomas is doubtful and says he will not believe until he can see and touch for himself. Or in other words, Thomas wants proof in the form of empirical, empirical verification. But really, what's wrong with that? Wouldn't you want proof? In our scientific age, we have all been trained to verify through sensory experience and evidence. Thomas actually stands as a pivotal figure in the Christian story precisely because while all the disciples before him did get to see and touch and hear Jesus directly, the millions of us who come after Thomas don't have that opportunity. So you see, uh, 
a new phase or new stage of church life and faith begins with this story of Thomas. Thomas stands at a transition point. Yet notice how Jesus responds to Thomas' demand for proof. He doesn't rebuke him for wanting it. In fact, Jesus gives him what he needs for faith. He lets him touch him and see him. But then Jesus goes on to say, for the benefit of all of us who will follow Thomas and hear of this story, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That line is intended for us, of course, who cannot see, cannot verify, cannot amass proof, and yet are invited to the blessings of faith in Jesus Christ nonetheless. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, what do we need in order to believe? How is it possible for us to believe if we don't get what the disciples and ultimately even Thomas got? You might ask yourself, what is the basis of your belief? Have you had some experience, some insight? Have you read something or heard something or seen something? How can you believe, especially when maybe like Thomas, you've already been disappointed or disillusioned and the last thing you want to do is foolishly believe in another impossibility? Is belief in something you cannot fully verify just wishful thinking? Is it just grasping at straws? I love the story that Henry Nouwen shared about an experience that helped him with that question. Nouwen was a fan of a group of German trapeze artists and Nouwen, who was a Catholic priest, says that he greatly admired these acrobats and they befriend, befriended him and even let him practice with them on the trapeze. Once he asked the leader of the, drew, of the group uh, about flying through the air and he said, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think that I am the great star of the trapeze, but the real star is my catcher. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air. I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me. The worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch. And the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. I think that in many ways we live like the flyer on the trapeze. We are spinning and swirling through life, unable to see where we're headed. We can't see or touch or prove the existence of a catcher who won't let us fall. But nevertheless, we must learn to reach out our hands and believe that we will be safely caught and held. Blessed are those who cannot see yet who have come to believe. Because sometimes reaching out in faith, unseeingly but trustingly, is really the only way open to us. True, we may not get the proof we'd like, the kind Thomas demanded, but really we don't have that kind of proof for any of the things that are most important to us, do we? How can we conclusively prove love or friendship or hope? We can't, but we know they exist, we feel them, and day by day and even moment by moment, we need to hold out our hands and trust that we'll receive them. May it be so. Amen.